What's up, guys? Welcome to Lado Files live stream. Today's going pretty well. I shaved myself. Bleeding won't stop. Cut myself while shaving, and we have no guest. But we can still have a great show. So everyone's here. It'll be a transition. So we'll be uh, waiting for the guest. If he shows up, that'll be great. I have an exciting show planned. I'm talking to astrophysicist Hakeem Olusei. I don't know what happened to him. Hopefully he's okay. Uh, we just talked to him recently. So anyway, hope he shows up. If he does, we'll roll with that. Until then, let's talk about some exciting physics stuff. If you guys watched my recent, recent video, let's go ahead and share this. This is Mark McCandlish, alien reproduction vehicle. One of my top vehicles or top videos lately. Let's go ahead and just watch the little entrance to it. And he said it was remarkably simple. There wasn't that much to it. The ALV system, for all of its claims of flashy, out-of-this-world propulsion capabilities, was indeed remarkably simple. It could be described as a large-scale, souped-up Tesla coil, designed to negate gravity and inertia. With off-the-shelf navigation and life support systems bolted on, almost as an afterthought. You could think of it as the Model T of anti-gravity vehicles, an industrial dune buggy or crude hot rod that can get you to Mars in a few minutes. In this version at least, first class seating was still a way off. Here's the components. We'll just watch through this and then I'll show you a breakthrough later. From everything I've been able to gather, um, it, it helps to understand what some of the components are. There's a, a large capacitor array on the bottom of the craft. It's um, in the smallest version, it's 24 feet in diameter. The outer edge of the plates and the capacitor section itself, they're shaved off at that same 35 degree angle. So you have a series of plates that are progressively smaller as you get higher and higher in the stack. And there's 48 sections that are all set up like that through the middle. That's an important note because the Byfield Brown effect talks about asymmetric capacitor plates. Okay, so basically it, it needs to get smaller to supposedly take advantage of the Byfield Brown effect. That's what I would ask Hakeem. If he, uh, uh, the crew compartment is a central column uh, that's called the amplifier section that's in the middle of the craft. On the very center point of that column is what looks like a large nine foot diameter flywheel type mechanism. Then around the belt line of the, uh, the crew compartment is a uh, about a two foot wide coil of wire that's embedded in the same glass like material that the capacitor section plates are embedded in. And there's a, a kind of flange. Or... So I wanted to pause here because I didn't really talk about this too much, the flywheel um, in my ARV video. You know, basically you have your capacitor down here is built into primary, I guess the primary Tesla coil. And then that's wrapped around supposedly all the way up to make your secondary Tesla coil. So your main magnetic field would be right here, right? Right in the middle. And so that's what this flywheel I'm guessing would take advantage of is this changing magnetic field. You know, if you could really change the magnetic field very quickly. Okay. So that flywheel and whatever this electric coil is around it. That column is what looks like a large nine foot diameter flywheel. He says nine foot diameter flywheel. And later it sounds like he thinks that thing is spinning, you know, underneath the pilot's feet, you know, basically it's spinning. There's another weird point about the pilot that I wanted to mention. I didn't have in the video. Let's check it out. Type mechanism. Then around the belt line of the, uh, the crew compartment is a, uh, about a two foot wide coil. Okay, they, they label it as the antenna around the flywheel. And again, that's right in the middle, and it follows that same asymmetric line. So he says later on that as the craft is flying, right, it basically goes straight up, is that somehow it's able to gain energy as it goes. So it actually, the faster it goes, the more energy it gains. That was his... The crew compartment is a, uh, about a two foot wide coil of wire that's embedded in the same glass like material that the capacitor section plates are embedded in. And there's a, a kind of flange or fairing that traps the top and the bottom surfaces of the coil. You can see that it traps it there and at the top. But in between are a series of explosive bolts that run all the way around the craft. Let's see. What's this quite What's your view of John Searle's anti-gravity machine? That's a great question, Jonathan Pope. I, I have it later. Just uh, stand by. I have it up uh, up next, actually. So this is the... 
Okay, so if you watched my alien reproduction vehicle, if you have no idea what I'm talking about in that, uh, what I just showed there is I'd recommend watching that alien reproduction vehicle uh, video and then we go through it more. What I wanted to show here is some basic uh, a breakthrough. And sorry, uh, we had some technical difficulties. But there's a company called Hellion. So Hel Hellion, I spelled it wrong. Hellion Fusion. Okay. And what I wanted to show is this, this form of fusion. And they say they've already done it, by the way. They say they're doing it now. They just came public with it, I guess, four days ago. But they do the same thing, okay, and what similar. So what they do is they're using very strong magnets, okay, and they're accelerating, basically accelerating an ionized gas, which is a plasma. And that's what, if you remember back in the alien reproduction vehicle, you know, this center tube here that I just showed, right, with that flywheel going around, that's the flywheel, right? And there's the pilot supposedly just sitting up above this super spinning flywheel. Um, yeah, anyway, and then they have this tube, right? And inside this tube is supposedly this ionized uh, mercury vapor, right? So basically a plasma. So what they're saying is there's a plasma in here, some sort of plasma vortex, and the Tesla coil essentially hits it or zaps it. I don't know, you know, or is the Tesla coil just to make uh, the magnetic field? Or is it actually using that to ionize the plasma or do something with the plasma? Could this be a fusion generator <laughs> is what I'm, what I'm saying, which sounds ridiculous, right? But look at this. So here you have Hellion, first to fusion. I mean, look at these guys. Let's see if we can get it to play. So basically what it is is it looks like a dumbbell. Let me see if I can get a better art technology. Yeah, so basically it has a, it's a dumbbell, right? Six feet tall. And what they do is they have plasma generator here ionized, and then they just accelerate it super fast using magnets, and then they have the plasma in here, right? And they do the same thing from the other side and slam it together. And then right in the center now, they have started fusion, okay? But they haven't continued it. And it's very interesting because the CEO says, we don't want to continue it, right? Because all, all we need to do is to generate the strong magnetic fields. Because then what you do is what's going to happen is just like on this alien reproduction vehicle idea, I guess, you know, no one knows if it's actually, you know, real, I guess, for, for real. Uh, but here it's creating these giant magnetic fields in here. And by pulsing those back and forth or changing it, you could actually generate, you know, electrical current in these coils. Um, and so they're doing a similar thing where they're basically generating a giant magnetic field here, right? And then they have nearby um, nearby batteries, essentially, that can convert that. Or however they do it, they're converting that magnetic field direct into electrical energy. So they're not doing any of this, you know, heating up water, turning a, a antique, you know, steam turbine. They're going direct into electricity. And they're doing it just many multiple times using pulse pulsed energy right so pulse power so for me i just thought it was interesting to see they're using and this is apparently real right now um this technology you know this basically <laughs> uh arv drawing so that that's impressive all right and while we have people here let's talk about that was a good question the searle generator so this is the arv that's that hellion technology i thought was quite interesting and then we get to Professor John R. Searle. And uh, let me just play. I have a clip right here that basically explains it, starting at minute three. So this is this is a Searle generator. There's actually companies supposedly doing this as well, SEG Magnetics. So we'll check that out in a second. Uh, but this is basically a Searle generator running. Let's check this. First move, they provoke electrons to migrate through the four layers of the plate, from the neodymium core, through the gate layer, the magnetic layer, and the emitter or copper layer. This activity repeats through the rollers and the plates. Unlike conventional generators, the electrons will be moving at extremely high velocity. Conventional currents are slow currents, and they build up heat. The more current you draw, the more heat you get. This system is the opposite. The more current you draw, the colder it gets. So this is a Searle generator. It's basically many magnets. Okay, If you have a long... I guess a bar magnet, right? If you cut a magnet, you you will always get a north-south end. 
Well, if you take eight of those, I guess, and align them next to each other, right? If you if you go eight and eight, there's some some effects you get, some magnetic weird effects, and you can put this into a configuration that looks like this, right? It's basically neodymium core that that's critical for some reason that that either aims the electrons or draws them out, and then this, I guess, this magnetic system just draws free electrons from the air. I don't know where. It, does it get it in space as well? I'm not sure. Yeah, someone is building this, David. Let's uh, let's check it out. I'll play this while I find while I find the link. This is John Searle. He's dead, but uh, supposedly, so this thing basically will take off. It'll do anti gravity. So the idea is, if you spin that, it will it will fly. Longer as to speed up. And once electrons start sensing a homing point, they all start heading in the surrounding to that point. So relatively speaking, it is positive here, negative out here. Air is ionized, the current draws in the back of the center, and you have completed the circuit. So we said air is ionized. This is Amy, just one of an uncountable number of negatively charged electrons seeking a positive destination. She finds the positively charged neodymium core irresistible and enters the Searle converter device, becoming part of an enormous reservoir of electrons. Inside the neodymium, Amy meets Neo, an electron from the neodymium core. These electrons are drawn to the powerful magnetic flux line penetrating the four layers in the Searle design. They join together, forming a boson pair Helion's as they spin around the magnetic force, releasing them on their pathway to freedom. Yeah, it gets boring there and then goes back to here. Sorry about that. All right, so we have, I found SEG Magnetics. As the rollers move, they provoke electrons. So this is segmagnetics.com. So Alexei Novitsky told me about these guys. But basically, this is a SEG generator, like you just saw. These are those magnets, right? And these things will spin. And, and because they're opposing, nothing actually touches. So they're basically free floating essentially in their own magnetic field right so this whole thing generates weird magnetic field effects so these will spin around these magnets will just keep spinning around and form i guess formations here and somehow this will move electrons basically forces electrons and this thing will actually rise up anti-gravity device anecdotally it just slammed into the roof of the shack that they were testing it in all right man i wish hakeem was here i would ask him if this is possible. But we did find, thanks to the chat, this is Hellion's Fusion, which I think is so awesome and really reminds me of the ARV, right? Could it be possible that if we're doing this now, could could you have done it with government technology like 30 years ago as an ARV? Let's check this. Hellion's pulsed fusion device directly recovers energy, which is used to generate zero carbon electricity from fusion. It starts with Helion's fusion fuel, deuterium and helium-3. These fuels are injected as a gas into Helion's formation chamber where they are superheated into an ionized gas called a plasma. The machine's capacitors are charged and send electricity to magnets that wrap around Helion's device. The magnets invert the plasma's magnetic field on itself into a toroidal, or donut shape. This type of plasma confinement is known as a field-reversed configuration. The electric current inside of an FRC flows in a loop, generating its own magnetic field which confines the plasma. FRCs are formed at both ends of the device. The device's magnets fire sequentially, accelerating the plasmas toward each other at a velocity greater than 1 million miles per hour. They collide in the fusion chamber and merge to become one hot, dense plasma. In the center of the device, the machine's magnetic field is rapidly increased, compressing the plasma with a powerful force over 10 tesla. 
Due to the Lorentz force, this increase in field compresses the plasma smaller and smaller, increasing density and pressure until the plasma reaches temperatures exceeding 9 kiloelectron volts equal to 100 million degrees Celsius. At this temperature, many atoms overcome their electrostatic repulsion of one another. This allows the atoms to get close enough to each other for fusion to occur. All these fusion reactions within the plasma convert matter into new energy, which strengthens the plasma's magnetic field. As the plasma's magnetic field gets stronger, it pushes back on the magnetic field of the machine, causing a change in the machine's magnetic flux. In accordance with Faraday's law, this change in flux induces current in the machine's coils, which is directly recaptured as electricity and returned to the capacitors that originally charged the magnets around the machine. This whole process occurs in a millisecond and is repeated in a pulsed manner. Helion's energy output can be adjusted by changing the repetition rate. After each pulse, Helion's fusion electricity is sent to the grid and is used to power homes, electric vehicles, and communities efficiently, affordably, and with zero carbon emissions. All right, that would be the dream, right? But that's the idea. So it creates a magnetic field each time, magnetic pulse, After and each then they pulse, capture it. Helium. They can capture it. Supposedly they can do it right now, uh, which I think is just amazing. Yeah, for those people just showing up, thanks for being here. First thing, uh, Hakim did not make it. I don't know. Uh, hopefully he's okay. Um, chances are he just missed it or something happened. So we'll, we'll, we will take questions from the audience. First thing I saw was, can you explain... Maxwell's demon. That was what I was going to ask Hakeem, actually. Um, and so I actually set up a... That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. So we'll we'll play this here. This is just a little summary of Maxwell's demon and then see if this explains it for you. I'm going to play you a short clip here explaining Maxwell's demon. Well, actually, it turns out that even these specific high entropy configurations can be transformed to low entropy. You are finally going to have to meet Maxwell's demon. As well as unifying the equations of electromagnetism, James Clerk Maxwell was one of the founders of statistical mechanics. That. Understanding that entropy was a statistical phenomenon, he came up with a thought experiment mm. to explore Very just terrible. how fundamental the second law of thermodynamics really was. He imagined a everything. box with two halves, sealed by a wall between them. The wall has a tiny door, large enough for a single molecule to pass through. The air throughout the box is Listen the same temperature. It. So even if we open the door, temperature would stay the same. But the halves are in thermal equilibrium with each other. And if the box is isolated from its surroundings, then this is the state of maximum entropy. Let's introduce the demon. The demon has the ability to observe the speed and trajectories of individual particles in the system. Can it can also open and close the door between the sides. Welcome, guys. Every time the demon sees a high-speed particle wreck. approaching from the right, it opens the door to let it pass Killing to the everything. left side. And <laughs> when it rains, it pours. So Maxwell's demon. What is the big point? So James Maxwell, basically, he said that thermodynamics always goes towards one direction, right? So the second law of thermodynamics is that it always goes towards disorder. This is how you know a chemical reaction will happen, right? If you put two chemicals together that will react with each other, okay, you know they will react with each other because they will react towards more entropy. So we write that in chemistry, at least in chemistry, we write entropy as adding from that equation. So basically, you will have a higher entropy on one side, then we know the chemical reaction will go that direction, right? Because chemical reactions don't go 100%. Not everything mixes 100%, right? Some things just mix partially based on that formula. How much are they going to mix? You know, you'll at some point, you're going to run out of, basically, you're going to run out of use of entropy, I guess, in that case. You'll have not enough stuff to disorder. So Maxwell's demon, all he does is he reverses that. The point is, if you had a box, right? Hot and cold, and the air is freely allowed to mix, then after a certain point in time, the temperature in that container should equalize, right? It'll totally equalize. Well, Maxwell's demon, he's right in the middle. 
You have a little tiny microscopic demon. That's why he called it a demon because they couldn't account for it. They couldn't find it. It's like a gremlin that you can never find, right? That's the demon. It's not a demon in the sense of angels and demons, um, but it is a demon in the sense of it's a gremlin. So they can't really find it. So you have a little gremlin in there who just happens to know when a hotter molecule is going to this side and he opens the door, right? So he has a little door first. He has to be able to control the system. But now with information, he can tell which side it's going. So the, the point was, how can you account for really anything? If everything goes towards max entropy, then how can you explain order? How do you explain uh, basically how anything's organized? And I think that's where there has to be a little gremlin in the mix. So I guess that's how I would explain Maxwell's demon. All right. Entropy is king. All right, let's see. Last this. From Jacques. One question I have is this. So we know there are hot spots for UAP activity, like off the West Coast where Tic Tac activity was and over the oceans where the racetrack stuff has been seen by pilots. <laughs> I don't think that's a question. Yes. But it's it. Hopefully you have a different one. There we go. Could we all openly discuss, brainstorm what we think communication with these phenomena might look like? I think it is interesting. You have off and the center of the country. I, you know, I wouldn't even say it's, you know, limited to the to the coast. Maybe that's just it's easier to, you know, to visually find them. Or that's where our large ships with their radars can actually send out. Well, no, we should have much more cameras over the over the land. So I do, I find it interesting that it's on both coasts. Not necessarily similar though, unless there is Tic Tacs on the East Coast, but normally it's just box orbs. So it's almost like two different populations or, I don't know. Let's see. The demon is like a daemon in the computer science thing. Yes, it organizes. Yeah, it has to do the work. Yeah. They are attracted to a certain frequency. Do you know that frequency? Yes. Here's a question. More importantly, why would a clan in in intelligence show its position? It wouldn't. Yeah, it, there must be no benefit in the aliens, if there are aliens, right? There must be no benefit in them showing themselves to us. see everything moving toward chaos but coming from order i think it moves it's moving towards more complexity more order uh let's see i, I think consciousness is the only unifying where, where was that i think consciousness is the only unifying language of the universe hmm. could be consciousness you know supposedly that'll be the physics of the next 50 years information Consciousness, we certainly have a lot to learn. Doesn't fusion give us the energy to bend space time? I don't know. I wish we had a Hakeem here. I mean, you can make really large explosions. I'm sure there's some crazy effects going on at that scale. Yeah, as far as bending space time, I'm, I'm not sure. Not from what I can tell. Could be use, utilizing zero-point energy as Tesla envisioned, self-powering, possibly. Yes, I had another kind of idea. Something struck me. Haha. -ha. It's not playing. Sorry, let me share this. Man, that would have been so much cooler. Something struck me yesterday. It was lightning. You know, I was thinking about lightning. <laughs> and... Did you know one lightning bolt strike will power a 56 home town for a day, right? One day of power 56 home town and 1.5 billion lightning strikes hit the earth every day. And lightnings, I mean, I think we should actually harness lightning, like get rid of it. It doesn't seem like a very good thing. You know, like nobody goes out there. I mean, it's nice to see, but imagine if you could take lightning energy and harness it, right? 100 watt light bulb for more than three months straight. 1.5 billion lightning strikes a year that cause damage. 
so we kind of we briefed it last time was the was the Dr. Parkenstein did you guys see that? If you saw my live stream, uh, sorry, the video I posted with Vinny, Dan, and Carl, Carl mentioned Dr. Parkenstein. Dr. Parkenstein built, he allegedly in Texas, built a working Tesla energy transfer machine, basically a giant tower in his backyard. He made videos of it. He's a huge on TikTok from what I understand. I haven't met him yet. I really hope to. Um, Carl released that uh, on our, on UAP society. So basically if you imagine you can transfer energy, right? So it doesn't get free energy. You're not just generating energy. It's not a generator, but it will transfer energy. And he transferred it up to 900 miles allegedly in Texas. So what you do is you build a receiver and it's, it looks like a giant, you know, Tesla tower. That's what it looks like. And supposedly it can transfer the energy through the ground, right? Through the ground and I guess the air, right? It must ion it uses the ionosphere, I believe. Even the ionosphere is magnetized. I'm not sure if it goes that high. However, it works. You can transfer energy uh, wirelessly, right, through the ground, which makes sense, doesn't it? So, what if you could also hook a lightning bolt, <laughs> you know, like a lightning rod, right to that thing, right? Just hook it to that machine and then build enough transmitters in the local area that it can just power off of the lightning, get lightning strikes, right? I think they cause multiple, they cause almost as many gun deaths in America. I'm sorry, lightning causes almost as many deaths as guns in America. Not quite, but almost. So you could also minimize deaths in America. So I thought that was just an amazing idea that kind of struck me. Anyway, we'll try it out. What do we have next? Then why do racetracks and Tic Tacs exist? Yin and Yang. Thanks for being here, everybody. Hakeem, if you're just showing up, sorry, Hakeem, he didn't make it. He couldn't make it. Hopefully he's all right. But we're having a fun time so far. I'll go for a few more minutes. Answer your questions if you have any questions. I think communication would be via consciousness. Thoughts and feelings may come through to us. Everything has vibration. Maybe we can pick up and receive messages. Yeah, Daniel, I guess my point on that is we don't understand the physical universe um, fully, obviously, right? We're, we're still looking for the God particle. You know, basically, where is the bedrock of physical reality? And we're not finding it. So we're finding everything's just relational, kind of like electrical energy, right? You, you only know electrical energy is there when it moves, essentially. So in that sense, it could be that this isn't, we're just seeing one part of the reality. And when you come across these consciousness or weird effects through these UAPs, through the phenomena, maybe it's coming from a different dimension, something we can't necessarily see with our current senses, um, but it's still interacting with us. And so maybe that is through consciousness. All right. Oh, Tyler Durden. <laughs> yeah, welcome, guys. Thanks for being here. Can Maxwell's demon be explained in, in a scenario where let's say you got out to dinner, something I can translate to, something normal? Yeah, so Maxwell's demon is basically if you poured hot and cold water into a cup, you're expecting it after a certain amount of time to be the same temperature. Well, you'd be very surprised, right? If you put your finger in, it was hot on this side and cold on that side. That's Maxwell's demon. There is a little demon in there that's pushing the hot water to this side and the cold water to that side. You would be surprised by that. Well, I guess thermodynamically, that's what Maxwell's demon is. It's surprising to physicists, right? It's surprising to like general thoughts. Like it shouldn't, you know, everything goes normally towards disorder. Everything should be mixing, but what we find is stuff doesn't. And that's Maxwell's demon. Let's see, time doesn't exist. Yeah, time is a strange. Chat's trying to sound deep. Magnetism bends light. It must, right? Does it? <laughs> it's a good question. I, I need to learn more about magnetism. That's why I want to talk to astrophysicist Hakeem. Go into resonance with the sun. This, okay, yeah, I was watching uh, Joe Rogan, uh, Randall Clark, I believe, that show. They were talking about a Tesla generator uh, from the sun. And this kind of makes an amazing 
<laughs> another sense to me, okay? Tesla, the original Nik Nikola Tesla, I was reading his patents all through last week. He said that the sun is positively charged and the earth is negatively charged. So we could be actually in elect electric um, conductance with the sun, right? If you think about their solar wind, so the sun's putting out solar wind, hitting the earth, physically hitting the earth, hitting our ionosphere, our negatively, or at least our charged ionosphere. So what if you could tap into that? We talk about this fusion, fusion energy, right? we got these fusion breakthroughs, you know, 20 years, hopefully down the line, we will be able to get, you know, clean fusion energy with amazing amount of work, et cetera. But we already have a giant fusion reactor. We're flying right next to it. I mean, if you imagine the earth's like this big, right? The sun is like, you know, there's this giant fusion reactor, literally, you know, right over there. You can see it, you know, go and look, it hurts your eyes to look at it. You know, I'm, my guess is there's some way, like one of these Tesla generators, even you build in a mountain, what he was saying, that somehow completes the circuit with the sun, right? And then now we can just draw off that off that energy. And that would be essentially, you know, free energy, I guess, in a sense. So anyway, exciting stuff. I hope it seems like it's something's gonna break through. Magnetogravitic drive cancels space time. If it made if you could bend space-time with fusion, then that ARV, maybe that's how it gets there, you know? Does anyone here actually believe that we are considered intelligent in and around the galaxy? <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone? I, if there's intelligent life, I'm sure we're, we're lower on the totem pole. Let's see. Robert Paulson. 1.2 gigavolts. That's it, man. What if it comes back to it really was we find out you can time travel, but you just need a, a, a 1.2 gigawatt pulse from a Tesla. Dr. Frankenstein, Dr. Parkenstein, he's 20. The kid is 20. I think lightning. I mean, come on, literally one point. Think about it. 1.5 billion a year. And it starts like 10,000 fires. Why not harness that? Plus, you're taking energy out of the atmosphere. Is that going to help with other global warming effects? So the idea is hook up a lightning rod to that Tesla energy transfer machine device that Dr. Parkinson's make, Parkinson's making. That's the idea. I think it'd be so cool. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, don't wait till lightning is at the point. You know, somehow I, I have seen also this. I was re again reading through this. There is a research papers saying they were able to induce lightning by shooting lasers, I think, into clouds. They were able to induce lightning in the clouds. Sprites to Earth. If you look at where we're looking to, Hestal and Lights, if you look at Mount Wilson, um, if you look in Colombia at the phenomenology, it seems like, you know, in these areas of weird mountain shapes, mountain bases, Why do UFOs have lights that makes no sense? Uh, thanks for the question, Craig. What, what I've seen is that it seems like light is intimately related to matter. Um, yeah, I think we can't tell it apart. And it may be that matter is just frozen light or it's some standing wave frequency or something. That's kind of my own guess. So I think if true, again, then they would aliens would use light because it would be the best way to maneuver matter to affect us. They can do what, if they have all command of light and matter, right? They can command that relationship. Then when they're affecting things, they will be, it'll look to us, I think like light beams, you know, like just light, but maybe it's matter. They're shooting some weird matter. You are supposed to trickle download the power of lightning, trickle download. Yeah, I mean, imagine you put it up in these mountains, you know, where you just have huge, you know, high lightning strikes or Florida has tons of lightning, you know, maybe large flat areas. You just build one of those towers and now you can power everybody in the local area. You know, imagine that. This is where free energy, you know, they talk about this people getting killed. I just put it out. As soon as I think of it, I tell, I tell you guys, so. Respect to intelligence. If it was clandestine government, they would first make it as non-observable as possible. Well, you could have decoys. 
you know, de decoys and distraction tactics are also very useful. So not always, but yeah, initially you would want it to be non-observable. Yeah, I'd have to agree first. I think you're correct. Time is not constant. It varies everywhere. Some places more than others. That, yeah, that's a crazy concept, isn't it? Gravity, I think, is caused by time dilations. Mass slows time. Time is speed of causality. It's quite interesting, you know, especially the recent YouTubers, dialectic, dialectic, um, I believe that's how you say it. He has, uh, he was in the pace in theories of everything, uh, Kurt's pace exercise. And he makes, he made a recent kind of viral video on that, touching on that topic. It's pretty amazing. Cool on basically gravity is, is not a force. That's also, if you haven't watched Veritasium's video on that i watched i watched it multiple times just trying to get it to sink in but it yeah it's very interesting gravity is not a force right <laughs> you're, you're accelerating you're essentially accelerating up so insane to me establish a standing wave with the tesla generator or with the lightning you're seeing plasma reactions i'm sure ionized anything is plasma yeah the fourth stage of matter, right? I think it's honestly, it, it, I think it is kind of interesting, coincidental that there hasn't been more like plasma research since the 1980s. You know, when I was growing up, it was like neon signs were everywhere. Plasma was kind of a big deal. Um, and I just assumed you'd never use it for anything apart from a neon sign, but it is the fourth state of matter and we say fourth state of matter i'm assuming that means there's other characteristics you can get so what if you vaporize mercury mercury is a semiconductor and you vaporize that thing and it's magnetic and you can ionize it you know well, obviously if you ionize vaporized mercury can it do anything weird you know are you going to get interesting effects because silicone you know the reason we're able to get our chips so fast with silicone is Honestly, because of the chemical matrix makeup of silicone, the shape of the molecule, everything about it, it just it's a perfect semiconductor. So we can just continue to make the the logic gates smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? That's how we that's what you hear seven nanometers. Seven nanometers is the space between the one and the zero, right? That's the the gate, right? You need something to shock across. So that's it. And silicone was a natural element, right? That we just happen to have on Earth. Maybe that's like some super element that we have, or, you know, that's why we're able to go so fast with our silicone chips, how we're able to create them so quickly. So could there be something else like could mercury or some other, you know, element, could it be crazy as a plasma? Could it induce other effects like these ionized magnetic plasma effects? You know, that would be the general idea. Someone said, why would they be interested in us would be like ants to them. Then I said someone like Darwin would spend their whole life studying ants. <laughs> yes. And hopefully he's nice to them. You know, that that would be the... You have to assume if, if we're being taken advantage of, then it's already happening. So the hope is, well, things haven't gone so well. But honestly, I think I'm pretty optimistic about the future. I know everybody's down. It, it, politics is just a mess in the U.S. But actually, if you leave, there's... <laughs> It's pretty nice. Uh, I would just keep it together. Uh, Wardenclyffe Tower. Yes, exactly. Does anyone know what a Wardenclyffe Tower does? Man, Hakeem, Hakeem. Let's see. The air itself holds energy. In what sense? See, if they really wanted to be open and communicate, our governments couldn't stop them. Why do we keep insisting it's the governments trying to keep it under wraps? Yeah, I think that's true. And I've seen that recently, right? If if they, them, others want to make themselves known, then it should be easy at this point. Hmm. But I guess the government, it, the idea is they have a lot of evidence that they're not releasing. That's the re the idea is why would they keep it secret also? But then you've been argued that maybe there's some agreement, right? If you, John Ramirez said that he was on Martin Willis recently. I watched, that's a good, that was a great interview. Um, 
John Ramirez was basically saying is if it's true and Roswell was, was true, right? It happened. And there were aliens that came down. Then there was a an agreement, right? That's the anecdote. Anyway, that's the conspiracy theory created by the CIA, right? That, that word, um, that Eisenhower met, uh, with them, they had some agreement. So maybe we're just adhering to that agreement. What do you think of Ben Hansen's latest video? Mick West had a field day with it. He did. Yep. I mean, that's what happens, man. If you post online, you're going to get kicked. <laughs> you're going to get kicked in the pants sometimes. When I watched it, actually, I'd just seen another video. And, and that's the reason I kind of thought it would be a mundane explanation is I was researching another uh, event that looked almost just like that, but but many uh, many flashes, you know. So I think it's just the way the way it goes. Um, I'm glad he's out there doing it, and it it answers the question quickly, right? Um, it, and that's what I've learned too. I, I like posting things, a to get it just out there, right? I'm not keeping it to myself, and then b I think of YouTube as like a computer, basically like a processor. So I'm just putting out. Content, I, I don't want to obviously put out incorrect information, you know, but at the same time, I, I put out stuff that I want to get looked at. You know, I want your guys' feedback. And it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. Have you done mushrooms? Perry here. I can answer that. Yeah, I have. I'm a curious guy, man. I'm very curious. Uh, I was in the Air Force 20 years, but I've been out of the Air Force and I live in a country where drugs are decriminalized. So <laughs> I think it's 420 where Chris is. Is it 440? The law is one. I read that recently. It was excellent. Or I watched through Abnu Anku, his series on law of one. Yeah, pretty mind blowing. I was, uh, again, amazed that there's seven levels. The law of one... It, I, again, I hadn't heard of it, uh, but it's basically a un universal view, supposedly from 100 years ago, I guess, uh, written to us from the ancient civilization of Venus. So the idea, and I, mean, I guess, proved that it's false. 2.5 billion years ago, Venus had a advanced civilization that basically like moved to the next phase. We're in the third density. We're in third density out of seven. And so this civilization from six density uh, basically communicates back through us or back to us, like helping us out. And so they give us the explanations. And what was interesting to me is there's seven levels of, you know, getting back to one. It basically, the universe is, is one super being from what I can tell. Um, and basically, we're all on our paths, soul paths, essentially, um, learning, experiencing, and then you have positive and negative, right? And there's different, there's two polarities, positive and minus. And what was also quite interesting for me, and we, we're using this in our upcoming um, digital collection for UAP society, the crypto UAPs, is the polarity. So law of one says there's a polarity of the universe. Uh, and so you have minus and a plus. But what's interesting is I, growing up, I was just, why would you have evil in the world, you know, what is the point? And that was always the thing for me. If God exists, then, you know, why is there child cancer? You know, uh, it didn't really explain it. So it, the law of one, I, I like that it gives a, a reason um, because in order to have free will, you have to allow even poor decisions, terrible decisions, right? Or, or evil decisions even. Um, but if you take away those evil decisions, now you don't have free will anymore. So there's no one to learn by their mistake. So if we're in this, you know, column essentially uh, purifying as we go back um, to seventh level, um, then that would be the plus and the minus. And that's why we would have evil and that's why we'd have positive. So law of one, I thought was, was quite interesting. Actually, I, I do, I do really uh, like it. it seemed to resonate, uh, resonate. And we'll use that in our upcoming uh, collection. As we talked frequency and resonance equals quality. Let's see, 364 people. Thanks for being here, everybody. We're supposed to have Akeem here. Sorry. I, hopefully he's, he's okay. I would like to get him back. This is the plasma research. How to harness the neutrino stream. Neutrinos. 
Neutrons are also quite difficult to deal with. It seems like neutrinos and neutrons, as you get smaller and smaller, those are, they become problematic. Let's see, what else? Sorry, Jay, but we'll read this. Speed of causality is special rules, but there are always special rules for light. That's why they say dual nature of light. Uh, this is interesting too. When two neutron stars accelerate revolutions, it creates a more significant gravity wave. Therefore, spinning mass increases the effect. So we just have to spin matter fast enough to create the field. Huh, quite interesting. Yeah, I think we'll learn just so much, right, with these recent fusion breakthroughs. If that helium fusion core is legit, that means you're creating, um, basically you're smashing two little particles together. You're making two new particles, but the two new particles are lighter. <laughs> so that's what creates all this all this energy right you have some excess energy but we're going to learn so much the helion ceo he already mentioned that they had to actually enlarge the chamber right because the it was it was too small based on all their models um the ion pla the ionized the plasma shouldn't have been heated hitting the walls right it's like millions of degrees so they actually had to make it bigger so they were learning so the more we know the more we'll learn our planet's core yeah, who knows? You know, my kid's textbook, <laughs> I went and looked at the textbook and they've basically added nothing. You know, the earth, if you look at the side view of the earth, it's still just like, it's red here, it's a core, then it's orange like most of it, you know, that's the mantle. And then it gets to <laughs> basically the surface. You know, I basically forgot it. Ants are pretty interesting. I mean, ants rule the world. If you look at it, I think they own at least land. Quantum is a relabeled ether. Cool. Welcome, everybody. We'll go about uh, 10 more minutes. Please smash that like button if you do like this. Tesla. Uh, is that from the, the oxygen? Yeah. I think that's air has energy. So oxygen has electrons. We could probably use it. I would help the ants. I would also tell them what's going on so they don't feel like they're just running around in the dark all the time. What are these things? We got a lot of people interested, though. I think a lot of people are looking right now. Bradius, hello. What's up? Thanks for being here. What do I think of Salvatore Pais on Kurt Jaimungle's podcast? I've watched, he was on there twice. I've watched both of them. I, I mean, I, I watched through them both, and I don't remember any salient major points. You know, from what I understood is he seems kind of like a, a you know, serious man, kind of like a torn, tortured man. I don't know if his any of his devices have actually worked. You know, I, I, I believe him. I, I believe what he says, you know, I guess. But I don't think it's been proven. Humans are probably, I hope, more interesting than ants. Is this machine similar to the one based off crop circles? Hmm, that's interesting. Because there is, people say that the, the real crop circles is not the intricate ones. The real crop circles just look like a circle. You know, basically padded, padded it all down in a, in a weird manner that could be caused by some electromagnetic weird energy field. You know, and they also say that the, sometimes the plants, they're genetically altered. If I remember that right. Sorry. Whoa. I think we got the doctor. Is he there? All right. <laughs> we got him on. All right, guys. I'll let him get his bearings. But uh, Hakeem is here. I have been. hopefully you guys enjoyed my tap dancing it was it was quite fun actually you know so i'm happy to do these more often but let's bring on astrophysicist hopefully he's been watching this show hakeem olusse he's an american astrophysicist cosmologist inventor educator and science communicator he was a professor at the florida institute of technology and a frequent contributor to the discovery channel and national geographic happy to have him on anytime let's see 
How's it going? Yes. Welcome, man. How Thanks. are you? How are you? Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Great. Thank you for being here. Yeah. 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 I'm happy to be what here. What happened? Huh? Did I mess it up? Or did? No, that Should was great. You. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah, well, welcome. So, thanks for being on the show. Um, I know you're uh, you're an astrophysicist, and I've watched through. You've worked on ion propulsion. Uh, you've been an educator, so very happy to get your take on a lot of these different technologies that I've been researching yeah. lately. And we've yeah. had a lot of questions here already, asking, "Can you explain Maxwell Demon Maxwell's Demon to a four year old?" Because I don't, they didn't seem too happy with my uh, my explanation. What's Maxwell's demon? Let me see. <laughs> uh oh, we're in trouble. I don't know. I know ideas, but I often don't know the name of things. So Maxwell's demon is basically uh, the thermodynamic principle, mm. right? That the second law of thermodynamics is yeah. basically entropy. Everything yeah. goes towards greater entropy. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, so what Maxwell found is or he made up is a little gremlin right that yeah. basically is how could it, what he argues is that maxwell's demon raises a little door right if you mix a hot and cold liquid maxwell yeah. demon will be in the middle raise the little door so that over time based on his information he's able to separate hot to cold so oh wow I, what so it violates the second law of thermodynamics is that the idea exactly yeah huh. That's the idea of uh, demon uh, Maxwell's demon. Oh wow! Actually, no, I can't explain that to a five-year-old, a thirty-year-old, or a hundred-year-old because I, I haven't thought about it. I have to talk, think about things before I can talk about them. Yes, Which that brings, wasn't one of the yeah yeah. You know, like for me, the big learning moment as a graduate student, you know, trying to learn rigorous science from being like a guy interested in science. Yeah, was learning the difference between when I know something versus when I believe something, right? You know, and so I always, you know, if you look at my very first publicly recorded speech that's on YouTube, it goes back to like 2010. And I talk about the difference between knowing and believing, right? And knowing is I have confirmed this to actually be true versus I accept this as being true without actually confirming it to be true. And I th throw the third one in there, which is faith, which is that I, I accept this as being true, even in evidence of the opposite, <laughs> right? I have, yes. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't, I haven't looked deeply into Maxwell's demon to understand it. So I really can't have an opinion on it. Okay, Excellent. So yeah. as an astrophysicist, then what is, what is your take on the, the crisis in cosmology, the so-called crisis in cosmology? What yeah. can you explain that? Yeah. So the idea of the crisis in cosmology is that we have two different ways of measuring the expansion rate of the universe. Um, one comes from studying light that originated from, you know, 13 and a half billion years ago. And the other is using observations over time. And so the observations over time is that, you know, if you look at a distant object, like an exploding star or supernova, if you know how bright it really is, well, comparing that to how bright it appears, you can tell how far away it is. And since light moves at the speed of light, distance can be converted into time. Also, as that light travels through intergalactic space, space is expanding and the light gets expanded by the exact same amount that space expanded while the light was traveling through it. So looking at how much the light has stretched gives you an idea of how much the universe has grown since the light left it. Okay. So those two observations together, observation of time versus size of the universe gives you the size of the universe versus time. Right. That's what a Hubble diagram is. Now, the difference is, is that the light, we have one measurement that goes back a few billion years and we have another measurement that is from many billions of years, double digit billions of years. And they give you two different answers on the expansion rate of the universe. Now, why is that problematic? Because the expansion rate of the universe has been controlled by three things the initial impetus that made it expand in the first place, right? Then you have the interactions of all the stuff in the universe. Some stuff, 
<clears throat> slows the rate of expansion. Matter, light, anything that has a positive energy density, they'll be attracted to each other gravitationally. But then there's this other stuff that we call dark energy, which seems to be the intrinsic curvature of space-time itself, absent anything in it. And that tends to move things apart, right? So one force is bringing things together. The other force is pushing things apart. And then there's the underlying initial impetus that started expanding in the first place. So if you only consider those three, both should give you the same answer. But if there was, for example, a time of, you know, oh, maybe there are times where the universe expands more quickly or more slowly just based on, you know, reasons we don't know, then you could get an answer like this. Or if we're misinterpreting the supernova data or we're misinterpreting the cosmic microwave background radiation data, then also you can have different elements. And so if anything could be wrong, it seems more like the supernovae data might be the one that's tricking us rather than the cosmic data. But put simply, two different ways of measuring the expansion rate of the universe give you different answers when we expect that they would give us the same answer. So that's the cosmic microwave background uh, and the supernova, type 1A supernovas. That's right. Yeah. It always seemed like just a really a linchpin that could easily be wrong was the, for me anyway, is the supernovas. You know, because how do you determine how far away something is? I find that a lot. It might, uh, if we knew how far away these UAPs, because we're looking yeah. after anomalous, you know, UAPs, if we knew right. how far away they were, that would solve like 99% of our <laughs> discussion. It really would. Yeah, it really would. Even when yeah. you see these things moving, you know, you're like, okay, if you yeah. knew the real distance or the real size, then you could get yeah. anything else out. But you don't, but you don't yeah. right? Well, and, once and, you know the yeah. distance, you know the size, you know? And so really versa. all you need is the distance. Yeah, yeah vice versa, right? They, they're, they're one yeah. and the same. Oh, so in right. cosmology, yeah. the expansion yeah. of the universe ruins everything. So if you look yeah. at, there's three main ways that we measure distance. One is I know how bright something really is Based on how bright it appears, I can tell how far away it is. The other one is, I know either the size of something or how far apart two things are, you know, some distance, some ruler. And so based on how, you know, things appear to be smaller, the farther away they get, right? So based on the size it appears, I compare that to the size I know it is, that gives me an answer. Then there's the time the light takes to travel to you, all right? Now, here's the crazy thing. Because of the expansion of the universe, all three always give you a different answer once you're sufficiently far away. And neither of the answers that the three give you is actually the correct answer. <laughs> the so-called yeah. co-moving distance is the correct answer, right? And you have to take those three measurements and then make some assumptions about the nature of the universe, right? What we call your cosmological model. Put those together and then you can get out this co-moving distance. And here's why that is. The expansion rate of the universe makes objects look artificially dimmer than they really are. So as you go out, objects rapidly appear farther away, even though they're not. The light travel time, no matter how far apart, how far away something is, they asymptotically approach the age of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the size thing. So there are objects. So as you go farther away, objects look smaller, but then they begin to look larger. Meaning they're they appear to be closer. Why is that? Because when the light started traveling to us, the universe was much smaller, and then the universe took them away. But we're still getting that angle from when they were closer, so they appear bigger than they are. So if you go to Wikipedia and you look up, you know, cosmological distance indicators or something like mm -hmm. that, you'll see a nice plot of all of them. And so you know, even though the universe is only thirteen point eight billion years old, we can see galaxies that are forty billion light years away, but mm -hmm. Their light has only been traveling to us for 13 billion years, <laughs> right? So it's it's a weird thing, you know. They were bringing that up too. We were in the chat. We were talking uh, before. Was basically isn't time also different <laughs> in in all places? I mean, it seems like it's, it actually it's very is. different. There, there is no such thing as the age of the universe, right? Yeah. It's it's. But here's the thing: the cosmic cosmic microwave background radiation 
sort of averages out over all the structure in the universe. So it's a convenient clock. So even though everything, you know, where there is more matter, time moves more slowly where there, than where there is less matter, like in the voids between galaxies. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the voids of, you know, the voids of space are older than where galaxies are. <laughs> right? So, yeah. yeah. So, but because it moves slower. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. So yeah. time moves slower where there's no matter. Where there is matter. Where there where is there, matter. Sorry, where there is matter. Yeah, yeah. so it's like a, a gravity well. I, I kind of thought yeah. I'd think of that as Earth, too, is yeah. um, basically just a gravity well. Right. But, you know, if you look at it, right, so you have this. Let's look at the gravity wells. First, yeah. the galaxies are in these giant dark matter halos, right? So now you have this giant, big, super massive, uh, uh, you know, gravity well from the dark matter. Now, mm -hmm. if you go to the center of that, you know, one-tenth the size, you now have a deeper gravity well, which is due to the baryonic galactic mm -hmm. matter, right? And then you go to the center of the galaxy, you have an even deeper one due to the supermassive black, black hole, right? So it's like this Whoa. drill almost, drilling into space-time because, yeah. you know, we think the black holes spin, and at the center there's not a singularity, but like an annulus, like a little ring that's, you know, so. <laughs> burning, burning into the whatever. Yeah, what? whatever the hell space time is, right? Because it's really maximally curved at those points, right? And that curvature is what determines a lot of things that, you know, in our universe. And you mentioned, I didn't know about this dark matter halo, you know, because to, so in my, my theory, you know, is basically I propose, again, just as a theory, as an idea, really, to, yeah. to investigate. Hypothesis. It's a hypothesis. Yeah. Exactly. So hypothesis is that the, basically, where the universe is scalar. Right. So I made a video. Uh, the universe is a brain. You know, you've seen that recently where there was a in 2020, they basically found a, a research article out of out of Italy saying that the, the galaxies were the same density as neurons. If you do a slice, are you familiar with that? I saw that there are as many neural connections in the brain as there are galaxies in the observable universe. I saw that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I didn't see the original paper. I just saw like yeah. the numbers. Right. Yeah. They found st statistical, basically with statistical deviation, with enough statistical analysis, uh, they found correlation between the density. So like mm -hmm. you mentioned there, I think number of connections. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry, number of connections, uh, density, uh, and then basic structure, I think. So mm -hmm. anyway, that, that would be the furthest reaches. But what, I, what I'm arguing is that you actually have repeating structures. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you think of a solar system, uh, I've always thought the solar system looks like an atom, you know, mm. I, I mean, in basic, in basic structure, obviously, you know, there's electron fields as you go smaller and smaller, but you have one nucleus, right? Which is 99.9% .9 the mass. mass of that yeah. system. Yep. And right. then you, it's charged particles, right? You look at the earth, yeah. you know, we're charged. We have magnetic field. There's obviously something, something going on there. And if, so oh. I've, what I found is there's actually, I kept finding relationships like that. Basically mm. kept finding patterns um, up to galaxies. You so know the what? Idea, yeah. That, that's, that's been a big part of my research. So we call oh. it yeah. uh, scale invariant phenomena and, oh. and self-similar phenomena, right? So it's like, you, 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 in, in my case, I was looking at stars and this is what led to the ion propulsion, right? So mm. if you look, we were looking at the surface of the sun and we we're looking at, scale invariant phenomena so we can create a model of all the structures that are in the sun's atmosphere and the corona the transition region and such right and then my graduate student noticed he's like look dr O, there's this one process called um uh what is it called tsr oh something reconnection right yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh what the heck is it called so um anyway it occurs on scales of millions of miles on the surfaces of stars, miles in cool. planetary magnetospheres, and light years on the scales of galaxies. And he was like, torsional spine reconnection, TSR. And he okay. was like, if we could do this, if it is truly scale invariant, then if we can do this in the lab, this will turn out to be the world's fastest ion propulsion technology because it accelerates ions to 3,000 kilometers per second. Whereas the fastest we have is like 50 to 60 kilometers per second. And so we did it. <laughs> and so, did, it did it work? Oh, yeah, it works. 
it works. Yeah, yeah. So it's you know, wow, if, if you look up his name, Dave Chesney, mm -hmm. you know, he has a lab down in Florida, yeah. and they're and they're building it up. But you know, the problem is it requires megawatts of energy, and mm -hmm. you know, we don't have megawatt reactors for space. Well, you, couldn't you use um, nuclear fusion or? There's that word again. I mean, we have nuclear reactors. <laughs> I'm all against it. You know, I just talk I, trash I, like we don't need nuclear energy. Then. I don't call it nuclear energy anymore yeah. because of the, the the optics. I call it natural mass energy. Natural mass energy. Yeah, like natural gas was a marketing yes. ploy. Natural mass energy. <laughs> it's the same with MRIs, right? It used to be yeah. nuclear magnetic resonance. Now they just mm -hmm. call it magnetic resonance imaging, right? Get rid of the word nuclear. So yes. I'm like, you know, the greatest storehouse of energy on our planet is in protons. And, you know, and that's what fusion and fission allow us to do is access that energy inside those protons. We were just talking about uh, Nikola Tesla. Mm. Uh, and well, first we we're talking about helium fusion, where ah, basically yeah, they yeah. have a plasma reactor. Are you aware yeah. of, of their reactor? I am. Yeah, yeah amazing. Yeah. yeah, we went through, I, sh I showed a video on it. Uh, we spent 10 minutes basically talking about that. So amazing yeah. technology but then relating it to um tesla technology i mm -hmm. did the alien reproduction vehicle have you mm -hmm. ever uh, have you heard of this vehicle no i yeah, have not well it, it uses a uh, tesla technology mm. uh is the idea it's basically one giant tesla coil mm. uh unfortunately my screen all died we had uh i can find it um but while we look for that what is your take on the fusion Basically, the, the big fusion breakthrough that just happened, I, yeah. I've been kind of discounting it like it wasn't that big a deal. I, I think Hellion's fusion plasma is much more interesting. But Well, it, it's a big deal in a particular way, right? It's the first time like we've been doing fusion, man-made fusion for a while, okay? But we never get more energy out than we put in. The fact that this is the first time we get more energy out than we put in, that is major. But the second thing that Helion is kind of like more close to is now how do you make that process so efficient that it's viable as an energy source and how do you convert that energy to electricity? So the, the basic way they do that in things that generate heat, which is what they're doing with the, the, the um, NIF type reactor you boil water and then you use the steam to turn a turbine, right? Whereas <laughs> no Helion boring. is going more directly to electricity. Yeah. It's like the difference between an optical telescope and a radio telescope. A radio telescope captures electromagnetic radiation and instantly creates an electrical signal out of it. And because of that, you can make a planet-sized radio telescope like the, the the Event Horizon Telescope, which imaged the, the, the shadow of the black hole, right? M87 yeah. in our own galaxy. Because it's, it, you can correlate that data. But for oh. light, you have to first hit it on a detector that converts the light to an electrical signal, like a CCD or something like that, right? And because yeah. of that, it's much more difficult to connect optical telescopes into an interferometer. And when you do, they got to be relatively close together. You can't make it planet wide, right? Um so it's it's like you know the the, the observing technology and uh, electricity generating technology kind of have the same problem. So Helion is closer to a radio telescope, and what NIF is doing is closer to like an optical telescope in the sense that there's more steps between taking what I have initially and then turning it into something I can use. <laughs> yeah, I loved how they skipped the steam and the turbine, and they just went right to electric, like. I think we we can get rid of steam and turbine, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's think, that's brilliant. That's brilliant, you know. And that's what engineers do. I mean, <laughs> you know, they're like, let's find a, a brilliant solution to this problem. Yeah, this <laughs> we is we start the, off uh, at brute force, and then we get, you know we we iterate to you know efficiency and cheap and money making. <laughs> start off with working, I guess. Yeah, brute force. So, yeah. how long do you think it'll take for this fusion break uh, the milestone? I guess to to where we get actual working generators. Well, it depends who does it first, right? So, you know, you got the three ways. You have the inertial confinement, you have the magnetic confinement, which are the tokamak. So there's ITER or ETER, depending upon how you pronounce the, the, the vowel I. And then you have helion, which combines the two of them, right? So whichever method, you know, a tokamak or a, a NIF laser inertial confinement is gonna have to boil water, right? Helion gets out electricity mm -hmm. directly, 
So if Helion works, you know, we're talking like, you know, anytime now or, yeah. you know, within a decade. It, the other two, I think it's like a minimum of like maybe two decades, per, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's why I just wasn't that excited, you know, when it's yeah. like, yeah. I mean, I guess I was happy. I was happy. You know, I, <laughs> I wasn't I never excited. Can, like predict yeah. which technology is going to win out at this yeah. this phase of the game because there's so many devils in the details. You know, yeah, that you might find it like, oh no, like for example, take NIF. All right, here's one of the big things that they found that they didn't expect. They sent in all these lasers to hit this little metal canister that causes the 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 matter to emit X rays that hit the little fuel pellet, which causes it to like ablate material outwards which caused the center of it to go inwards and fuse, right? And so they're like, oh, we're putting in this amount of power in the lasers, only to discover it. No, we're not. Because the, la the power from some lasers, instead of going into the canister, went back up the other lasers. Huh, okay. And leaked out. Exactly. Who would have thought of that? <laughs> right? No I guess one. You're, but just shooting across, maybe it goes across? Is that is that what happened or how well, is they, it? There's there's a, an arrangement where they come in at all these different angles, right? And, yeah. and so and they and they do cross and and mm -hmm. uh you know you wouldn't think that laser power would instead of going into the matter it would go up the other laser, yeah, like backwards. You know, it's sort of like mm -hmm. something I discovered a long time ago. I've never written a, a paper about it, but if you look at the equations of thermal conduction, you find that hey. Heat always goes from hot to cold, right? You, there's an equation. There's a part in there, which is the, what we call the temperature gradient. But if you ever use a hot skillet or pot that has a handle that's not insulated from the pot, and you're like, okay, let me do what I'm not supposed to do because I'm young and ignorant like I did. Let me take this hot pot and dump it in a sink of cold water. I would, I would notice that the handle in my hand would get hotter. Hmm. So clearly heat is moving backwards against the temperature gradient. And so it turns out that what's happening is if you have a large flux of some wave phenomenon, then you can get a backwards reflection, right? And that's, and that's what's going on is a backwards reflection of energy from the interface. And how, how is Helion getting their energy? Because I know they're creating a, an intense pulse magnetic field. Yeah, so what they do is that they create these, um, like an annulus of plasma, and the plasma creates its own magnetic field that causes it to even squeeze down tighter. And then, for, and then they collide them from each end and compress them even more. And so, you, you know, they get the particles directly out of the plasma, and then you also generate this fusion heat energy. 100 million degrees, I think, is what he said. Wow. It goes, to, I guess, 10 million when they hit kinetically. I was surprised... That it, it was so easy to stop, you know? Right, or, yeah, they yeah, hit yeah. Together, so they, am I. I, like, I would I would imagine what you there. were saying, like the lasers, they would just, you know, shoot by each other, yeah. but it didn't. Right. Why doesn't it just, like, why don't they just pass by each other? Like when two galaxies collide, you know, the stars mm -hmm. just pass right by each other. Why, why isn't it like that? I don't know mm -hmm. the answer to that. I'd have to look into the details, you know? You know and then while we're talking about Hellion here yeah. is, so this is this, it's an alien reproduction vehicle. Okay, so okay. it's this guy, Mark McClanlish, he came out in 2001 and said mm -hmm. that uh, anecdotally, these vehicle, three of these were made. He heard from his good friend who he trusts, went to an air show, and there were three of these vehicles, mm -hmm. right? This is the, uh, the story. Um, so it's interesting. It's just they explain in detail, you know, you could, I guess, at the air show, you could supposedly walk inside and mm -hmm. see all the little components you know, and they explained how it works. <laughs> so this is, the, you know, one of the first times I've seen basically how they, they explain, at least give a hypothesis, if you will, for a working UFO. Um, mm. So basically, you have on the bottom here, your capacitors. These are big capacitors angled yeah. at a certain angle uh, to give asymmetric uh, capacitance. So basically, it's taking advantage of the Bifeld brown effect which is basically if you put asymmetric capacitors next to each other, you will have flow. Um, mm. And that, again, all speculative. You can look at this later and, and let me know what you think. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, man. Yeah. So here's a, here's a little yeah. uh, <clears throat> trivia. So yeah. are you familiar with the 100-year um, Starship no. project that was led no. by Mae Jemison? 
So yeah, so DARPA came out with a proposal call for uh, you know, let's develop a um a uh mission to another star system, right? And so the idea is that so that's the website 100yss.org. So let and they and they had proposal calls over a million dollars. And so May Jemison, the former astronaut, won it. And a few years in, I became the chair of the energy and propulsion section, right? And and so, you know, various scientists and engineers submit their ideas for how you can actually do propulsion. And, you know, some of them, man, are so incredibly um, creative, like you can see nuclear bombs <laughs> to, to accelerate a spacecraft. And the thing is, is that the design, you know, this is not tin foil hat stuff. It's real stuff, you know. Um, the guy who submitted that one, who worked out the engineer of that one, he was like the protege of like Dirac or somebody like that. And, and uh, I don't remember his name, but he was in his 90s, still super sharp mind. But, you know, there's so many ideas out there that the public have it, has not seen. Yes. Um, and ways to use, for example, matter. For, you know, antimatter matter annihilation, which is the, the the most energy we could possibly get. That's what Star mm-hmm. Trek, the Starship Enterprise uses. But, you know, one clever idea this person had was instead of trying to create one vessel where you magnetically confine antimatter, <clears throat> you know, this large amount of antimatter that if it comes in contact with any matter is game over, right? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Not only have you destroyed your, your container, you've destroyed your entire city. Um the idea is use micro channel plate technology where instead of having one big vessel, you have many, many tiny vessels. Right. Um, and, and it's much more uh, safe than the other approach. And so there's so many different clever things that people can do. So our project that we did, we came up with what we call the, the magnetic reconnection rocket. We could reach one percent the speed of light at, uh, you know, at, you know, is that on- in here. Do you have it on here? I don't know if you look, if they have the, if you look under symposium and if any of the, um, like 2015 or something like that, if you look at the, uh, if they have a, it's in the proceedings. Okay. Yeah. So if they, if they have the proceedings available on there, then uh, we'll have to, yeah. We'll have to find it later. That's, yeah. that's pretty cool. I've not heard of that. Have you heard of, that reminds me, have you, are you aware of Bob Azar and his story? I've heard of Bob Lazar. I don't remember. Yeah. I think I did a show with him. I did a show with Bob Lazar in 2021. With Bob Lazar. Huh? With him. Yeah, with really? Bob Lazar. It was called, uh, it was a It was a UAP report release. We did it for Discovery. Is he a lot living or dead guy? Let's see. <laughs> I hope he's living. Yeah, he, he claimed in 89 he was working at S4, you know, on the uh, oh, yeah. alien. Uf- yeah. UFOs declassified live. It was a TV Really? Special. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. did not know about that. Sorry. Yeah, there's so much stuff going on, you know. UFOs declassified. So, what was your impression of Bob Lazar? I mean, I get asked a lot of questions. I I don't know what to make. You know, I don't. I I didn't form an impression. You know, I'm hanging out with a dude, and we're having a good time. You know, and and I brought my perspective as a physicist, right? And so, my perspective, yeah. you know, is to show me that something is what it is. You got to show me that it is what it is. You can't say it can't be this, can't be that, can't be anything we don't know. Okay, I buy that. It's nothing that we know of. What is it? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, and that's a different uh, thing. You know, you can you can speculate on what it may be, but illustrating to me that here is what this definitely is, is a, is a you know, it's another step. But I guess so, but Bob Lazar, so his, he's, he, he also has, I mentioned that there's not many working UFOs, but Bob Lazar gives a, brief literally saying this is how the propulsion system works yeah. uh, and he does mention antimatter he mentions yeah. in there that he he says uh they have element 115 okay you heard a stable form of it that we can't okay. get in our galaxy it comes from a or our our solar system because our solar system is too small it's a sun mm. you know again all speculative but it does seem to make sense to me so there's other elements again if you go back to my theory that solar systems are related to atoms, then it would follow along with my hypothesis that you would have different star systems with different nucleuses, right? You're going to have different amounts of suns. You're going to have different numbers of rotating planets, et cetera, all, all related. Mm-hmm. Um, so what he said is this, this stable form of 115 comes from a different 
solar system that has it just laying around, you know, like we have silicone right. very useful. Right. right. So <laughs> yeah. This 115 supposedly, uh, if you, uh, excite it, you can put it to 116. Okay. And then when it goes from 116 to 115, it puts out one antimatter particle. Okay. This is, this is how it works. Well, and then that a lot of different nuclei particle. do that. Yeah. A lot of different yeah. nuclei put out an antimatter particle. You know, huh. and, and, and certainly the bigger they are, the more they're going to do it. Right. That's that's for sure. And and it is the case that different conditions give rise to different minerals. You know, it's not unusual to, to open up an asteroid and go, oh, here's a mineral we've never seen before. Right. Or, or, or a meteorite. Right. Because how you form different compounds and exactly what the bond structure and all that looks like depends on the conditions under which it was formed. Right. So if you imagine, oh, this was formed in the core of a of a gas giant planet, you know, the types of pressures, <laughs> you know, you're going to encounter yeah. there, you know, is going to lead. It's just like space industry, right? There are things that you can accomplish in what, what they call zero gravity that you can't do here on earth, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that is definitely the case. And my feelings about life in general in the universe, I, I, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington post in 2021 on the topic. And my take is, you know, uh, definitely there's life everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, that seems to be the case. Right. And so, yeah. you know, the problem though is the following, you know, the so-called Fermi paradox. Here's my take on it. As we've looked around, you know, one thing that seems critical for life is the presence of fluids, right? May not be, mm -hmm. but you know, it seems that way for earth life. Where do we find fluids? Pretty much everywhere. Right. Earth isn't the only planet with water. There's, you know, even a tiny moon like Enceladus can have even more water than the Earth has. But that doesn't mean Earth is not special. Right. And what's special about Earth is that two things. The liquids are on the surface hmm. and they are bathed and the surface is bathed in sunlight. The liquid is bathed in sunlight. Most of the places where we find fluids is under miles of atmosphere miles of ice or miles of rock hmm. earth because it's sufficiently large the core has not cooled which means we have that liquid iron core and hmm. it spins really fast which means you can generate a strong current and generate a strong magnetic field so if you take venus same size as earth but it doesn't spin fast so it doesn't have that strong magnetic field mars is tiny right so it already cooled so it doesn't have the liquid even though it spins at the same rate so here we are with this incredibly thin atmosphere that survives because we're under this strong magnetic field. So even under the best circumstances, first of all, you have to be at least a third generation star to have a, a, a rocky planet. First generation mm -hmm. stars don't have any planets. Second generation stars can only have gas planets. Third generation is where you have enough heavy elements to generate things like rock, <laughs> right? And so yeah. once you have that on Earth, life got started incredibly early, which tells me that life getting started is a relatively easy thing to do. That's why I think life is everywhere where you have fluid. Happened right away, yeah. Yeah, but then under this ideal condition, so so that but that life used chemosynthesis, which could never generate, as far as we know, macroscopic animals like ourselves. That requires oxygen chemistry, right? But under the ideal conditions of that life being bathed in sunlight, it still took it about two billion years to say, hey, we can use the energy from that light to break apart water molecules to create sugar and give off this byproduct that we call oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. And even then, that oxygen killed off everything, sent the planet into a frozen state for 100 million years because it ate up the greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, particularly methane. But then once life made a comeback, it like just like bacteria become antibiotic resistant, they became oxygen resistant, learned to use mm -hmm. oxygen, and now we can build multicellular animals. That's only for the one ninth of our planet. If, if aliens came here, a billion years ago, Earth would look nothing like, or earlier, or 800 million years ago, it would look nothing like today. It would not be covered with life, right? It, it, you know, it would just be mold, you know, uh, slimes, bacterial slimes, right? So, now given that life comes about, does it evolve intelligence? Absolutely, almost every time, because <laughs> life, the the process of evolution, leads to detectors eyes, photon detectors, 
ears, pressure wave detectors, nose, tongue, chemistry detectors, skin, a lot of those different things, right? And you need a processor to, to, to understand that data. That's your brain. So you're driven to higher complexity. So a lot of things are, are intelligent, right? They can solve problems. They can look in the mirror and say, hey, that's me, right? You know, we're not the only things that can do that. But what makes humans special is advanced technology. We're not the only technology users, but we're the only developers of advanced technology. So my thing is life probably everywhere. The places where you can get sunlight on that life for billions of years, you develop macroscopic life, which always develops intelligence. Mm -hmm. But how often are you going to develop advanced technology? That's only happened once as far as we can know and we can tell on Earth, which means that that's the other big bottleneck, if you ask me. Getting sunlight on the surface and and surviving the oxygen apocalypse that follows that. <laughs> right? yeah. And then developing advanced technology. Those are the big bottlenecks. So, you know, if you look at uh, how many, you know, so I created my own Drake equation based on those elements. Uh, cool. Yeah. And it's coming out in my new book. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Yeah. Explain it. Uh, please. Well, my new book, I'm calling it, you know, it's based on, you know, how Norse mythology has the nine realms. No. Reality has <laughs> not. So, so, you know, yeah. Earth is yeah. Midgard, right? We're in the middle. And okay. You have well, Asgard, the realm of the yep. gods, Jotunheim. I know Marvel, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. But that's Norse <laughs> mythology, right? That's where you yeah. get that from. So in the real way, we do exist in Midgard, right? If we look at the largest known structure in the universe, the observable universe, it's 10 to the 26 meters across. If we look at the smallest known physical thing, the size limit on the neutrino is 10 to the minus 26 meters. And here we are at one yeah. meter, right in the center, right? Yeah. And then beyond that, you got to go to the cosmological realm where the curvature and expansion of space time completely changes reality. Below that, you go to the quantum realm where, you know, the you know, again, another complete reality. And then there's other, these other realms that I have above and below. And I'm not going to give away the whole damn book here. You got to buy yeah. it many times. So <laughs> many times, many times, over and over again. Like, OK, I read it. I want to read it again. Let me throw that one away and buy a new one. <laughs> yeah, I I'm gonna make you watch the this video that I made. Uh, basically, with my with the hypothesis is basically it goes out to the repeating scales of the nat of the universe, right? Right. And I didn't know the neutrino was ten to the twenty six. I put, minus twenty six. Yeah. I put ten to the minus eighteenth was gluons, right? Is that yeah. where muons and gluons? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I stopped there. Actually, I was yeah. like, "That's the end," you know? That's the end. Uh, right, but, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'll actually, look, I'll look that up. Yeah. I found a secret the what I found actually is you mentioned nine. Yeah. Uh, and when you, when you, uh, before you, before you came on the show, we were talking about the law of one, mm. uh, which is, it's an interesting whole theory in, in itself, but they have seven, they have seven dimensions, essentially densities. Mm. They call it densities of matter. The uh, law of one law of one. Yeah. Okay. It's quite interesting. Uh, you can look on YouTube. There's a, a, a series, you know, uh, oh. Abnu acne. I think he, he wrote it. Or made the videos quite quite interesting, but there's seven in there. And in my in my own theory, or sorry, in my own hypothesis, I also found that there was it repeated every seven steps. It seemed mm. like there was seven steps. Mm. And when I gave names actually to the steps, right? Because I'd already used numbers. I already used one, two, three um, for each step in size, right? It was one thousand, basically three zeros on the end. Mm. Um, so I started counting with A, and I went A, B, C, and I ended at G. And what I found is it repeated just like music. So again, mm. seven in my the hypothesis was seven uh, steps, essentially like notes, like the, like the musical right. scale, yeah, yeah. which, which in my mind makes sense. If you think of light as a uh, frequency, right? If mm. we still don't understand the full implications of light's duality, mm. if you do think of as light uh, as a frequency mm -hmm. uh, or size, essentially as yeah. a frequency, right? Then it is. Yeah. Then what I found is every 10 to the 21, mm -hmm. it, it repeats, like fully starts over. Mm -hmm. um, so you what can is the expect, it that you speak of? Uh, uh, like, uh, let's say cell, like I just mentioned. So solar system mm. uh, with atomic model. Mm. I would say general structure and physics. Yeah. I, I guess okay. that's how I'd relay it. 
okay. uh, formation. And if you look at um, the cellular level, so like right. that size of matter, yeah. you can't make a human. But right. At least that, from yeah. my understanding. But you no, can you make can't. a cell. Yeah. You're, you're so, into protists. <laughs> yes. So that's yeah. the dimension of life, right? So right. if you were, if right. you, if I shrunk you down like Ant Man, you know, yeah. to that cellular dimension to a cell, right? Um, whatever it is, whatever it is, the universe, the however it organizes, is that cellular structure seems to be the same as a galaxy, mm -hmm. right? If you dude, look, you're still in my yeah. ideas. You're still, <laughs> still in my ideas, really? okay, Chris. Excellent. I'm on to you. Cool. <laughs> now you love. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I did it in a slightly different context, but the exact same example. And mine really? is yeah. imagine if you shrink yourself so small that the cell to you is like the ratio of a galaxy to us now today. And then yes. you go and you study your universe the way we study yeah. ours. So, you know, when we study our universe, the first thing we did is like, oh, galaxies exist. And then now you're like, OK, they come in these different types, spiral, elliptical, irregular. And they're arranged this way and their inner workings are like this. So what if you did that from that very small scale? You looked around, and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, I see that cells exist. I see they come in different types, bone cell, muscle cell, nerve cell, right? Oh, I see how they're arranged to make That's bigger true. structures. Oh, I see how their inner workings are. But then I say, do you have any idea that you're inside of an elephant or you're inside of an alligator from that perspective? You know, to, to no. give a sense of, you know, what we can't know from studying our universe um, but then I asked, but can we, can you figure out, can you approximate that, you know, you're in this living thing and, you know, and there are these processes, right? Can you figure that out? Even though you might not have an idea of its external structure, could you figure out what the machine is, right? I call it a machine, but it's a living organism, yes. right? What the, you know. I think we're on exactly the same page. Um, this is what I drew out. And so I'm this have to is hit where you with the neuralizer. Can you see this? So yeah, the re this is basically the EMF diagram. You see? Yeah. Uh, but if you look online, they always stop here, right? Mm. If you Google EMF, yeah, it ends here at the building size, right? I and see. I was I just thought it was interesting. So basically, at at, at the atomic level, yeah. you know, you have life, and and I argue we see patterns of life at, as small as we can see it, at least to the to the nanometer level, right? If you look, right, DNA right. is right around here. Viruses. Yep. So viruses are even, well, I guess we don't know if there's life at the atomic level. That would be my, I guess my next question, but we mm -hmm. can see organization replicating molecules mm -hmm. here even, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty small. Yeah. And then like I mentioned is these are the step changes. So humans are right here. Right. Midgard, you would say, but I didn't go, I went to 10 to the minus, that says 15 here. Uh, so 21, you know, would be another but would be around the middle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so if you look here, so uh, a cell is a B, right? So we go up to where's the the next B is here, right? A galaxy. Mm. You see? Yeah. So like a stun, a stun is a... I don't know, man. The, the Milky Way is 10 to the 20 meters. The Milky Way is 10 to the 20 meters? Yeah. Oh, shit. Are uh, you really? Yeah. Okay. And you know what's crazy? All the star structures. Given that the Milky Way is 10 to the 20 and the universe, the observable universe is 10 to the 26, the yes. freaking visible universe is only oh. a million Milky Ways across, which is sounds really small, right? Yeah. So that's here. Okay. So yeah. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm off. You're off just a little bit. Oh, okay, no. You so have clusters damn it. Yeah, yeah. No, well, that's fine. Why, we, yeah, don't I put we, don't, we don't get it on the first shot. <laughs> Well, I put clusters, right? And then I put yeah. uh, large, large structures. Large structure, yeah. Yep. And so that's where humans are. So basically, if if the pattern, humans are like a D, right? Oh. And then you, so what I'm saying is we yeah. should expect uh, consciousness, consciousnesses potentially at this level. So this could be like the cosmics, you know? Yeah, if yeah. It's related to human. And the idea would be for whatever reason, that the level- celestials. The celestials, yeah, would be here, and then yeah. if you go ten to the twenty-one lower, yeah, um, we could expect that there sh could be, you know, human-like life uh, at that level. You know, if the Not, pattern it can't be human-like, man, because the atom doesn't exist. Like when we, you know, once you go below the size of, of, of the the the, uh, you know, some of these entities, you know, the proton, 
even at the scale of the proton, you know, they're not really objects anymore. And that's one of the big yeah. uh, things we don't tell the public, right? We, we show a sphere, but an electron is not a sphere. If an electron was a sphere, the cameras that we're using right now would not work, right? Because the reason why semiconductors work is because they have what are called a band structure. And this band structure comes, you know, it's, it's like, you know, if you look at an individual atom, the electrons have so-called energy levels, right? But every electron has to have a unique energy level. So if I bring two atoms together, those energy levels offset slightly from each other, right? So that they're unique. So if I have like any conglomeration of matter, you know, you're talking like over an Avogadro's number of atoms, then all those closely spaced energy levels become what we call an energy band. And mm -hmm. so you have energies where you can have electrons, then these forbidden energies that we call a band gap, and then where you can exist again. And what those are, are just like if I have a guitar, right? If I, hit, if I have a guitar string, it's tuned to a particular note. Boom! That means that only certain vibrations can exist on that string. It's those vibrations that the wave is zero at the two points where the string is held down, right? Every wave that exists on that string must have a zero amplitude at those two points. So that limits what can exist. But if I have an infinitely long string, any wave can exist on that sucker, right? So, um, you don't need reason, zero, you mean, I guess, or, huh? No, if I have an infinitely long string, then there is no limit to the wave. Yeah, you can make can the exist. wave as long as you want, infinitely. As long as you want, yeah. as short as you want, there are no places where it must be zero here, right? It can be okay. any value anywhere, right? So, what does this mean? The reason why our electronic cameras work is because standing waves like that are created inside of the silicon. So basically what happens is, you know, the atoms are arranged in these, the atom. in these crystals. So the electron as a wave is coming through. And when it hits another set of a nuclei, part of the electron goes past and part of the electron is reflected. So when a wave of the exact same wavelength and frequency interferes with itself, it creates a standing wave just like it was tied down on each end, right? <laughs> and so those stand, the existence of those standing waves, which only exist if electrons themselves are waves, is what makes our electronic cameras work, all our semiconductors, all our chips. So if that was not the case, if they were actually little spheres like we always draw, then none of our semiconductors would work. So based on the, the structure, yeah, I remember that, that silicone is... It's cubic structure, yeah, like this. It's I don't know. What we, I don't remember. I, I used to teach solid state physics, but yeah, I, I never. I don't save yeah. things in here. I empty it out. <laughs> quadrihedral, <laughs> cubic quadrihedral. But that's yeah. quite. In, so I didn't know it creates that a standing wave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The solid state the, physics, man. That was. Tough. I know. Is is but it, and so you know the crazy thing about solid state physics with all the books that have come out, still the best one is this one by Ashcroft and Merman, which came out like the seventies or something. I don't remember eighties. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's not the one I have. <laughs> I should get that, <laughs> yeah. one. dude. It's so good. It's so good. When the first time I taught it, I used the standard textbook that you know all of the universe are using, and I was like, "This thing sucks." Let me <laughs> let me find something better. And I started combing through, and I discovered Ashcroft and Berman, which is by the way what they use at Caltech, and yeah. it was like, "Where have you been all my life?" You know, <laughs> this is really going to help me now to get this stuff well. Yeah, the, the the jumps. You know, the fact that, like you just mentioned, the quantum aspect of it is really just tough to to come to agreement with. It is. Uh, but let me let me address what your your listener asked okay. about, which is yep. the James Webb Space Telescope. Excellent. So one thing I like to point you to is this past Monday's New York Times, where I was the cover story because I'm the guy who uncovered that lies were being told about James Webb, claiming he was some sort of homophobe running gay people out of the federal government, which was completely not true. And when I discovered that and published it, uh, some colleagues, you know, who considered themselves activists decided to do a two year smear campaign against me. So, uh, you know, whisper campaign. So look that up. But man, James Webb has already blown us away. It has. We thought that it took galaxies a billion years to form. No, says the universe, and James Webb Space Telescope is showing us, you know, well-formed spiral galaxies 500 million years after the, the, the you know, initial start of things, the inflationary epoch. 
I thought so, even less than that, wasn't it? Even less than yeah. Now it's been pushed love. back like three. You know, like <laughs> yeah. Well, because you know we're we're in the primordial <laughs> fireball up to three hundred eighty thousand years after the Big Bang. So you're talking about you know five hundred thousand years. Did I say five uh, five hundred thousand years? You know, you only have yeah. one hundred twenty thousand years there mm -hmm. for the Dark Ages, right? And we thought it would be another like you know six hundred billion, five hundred billion years of Dark Ages, but it's like no, maybe one billion. <laughs> wow. So yeah. wait, so the galaxies formed. So when did they form the? I mean, I mean hundred million. Huh? Okay, okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I keep yeah. hundred thousand, hundred thousand, right? So it's five hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. Recombination is three hundred eighty thousand years. So it only leaves one hundred and twenty thousand yeah. years of dark ages, right? I and think. if it's before five hundred thousand years, you're, you're you're going even less. So we're instead of galaxies taking a billion years to form. You're only taking, wait a minute, am I talking the right numbers? Yeah, 100,000 yeah. years to form. So the the other thing is um, I've noticed James Webb seems to be pointing out, and Hubble as well, is that they're yeah. finding all these other structures, like large structures of yeah. galaxies. There's flows. Yeah. There's like streams. Yeah. Like there's three Man, they got all galaxies kind of, around the Milky walls, Way. Yeah. There's filaments. There's yeah. the whim, as we call it, the warm, hot intergalactic medium. Man, there's so Whoa. much structure. But here's the thing. Excellent. We were talking about dark matter before. Where the baryonic matter goes, just like water follows the topology of Earth, hmm. matter gravitationally follows the curvature of space-time. And so the dark matter, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, the dark matter forms its structures first. But since it can't radiate energy, it has no way of, you know, making very compressed structures. So if you think about a star forming, if I have a gravity well, if some particle of matter wants to go in that gravity well and stay, it has to get rid of energy somehow. Otherwise, it's going to enter and come out at the same energy it went in. Yeah. Right? It's like an orbit, right? It'll just continue exactly. on. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't it comes in there and stays and the way that matter loses energy is by radiating giving off light dark matter can't do that so it remains puffy and big right so you get all these giant what we call dark matter halos that predetermine the structure the, the curvature of space time and then matter you know flows to those locations you know to those depressions in the curvature of space time that that follows from that and, and so what is your take on <laughs> What do you think matter is? <laughs> what, matter, what is I, my take is Albert Einstein's take. Matter is yeah. an illusion. The only thing that exists is energy. So if you look at the proton and you're like, oh, a proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark. Well, those two up quarks and a down quark only make up 1% of the proton's mass. The rest of it is energy in those gluons that you talked about earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, an experiment called Light in a massless box. So what makes matter matter? Two properties. It's gravitational behavior, right? And it's inertial behavior. So we call one the inertial mass. That's a resistance to yeah. your change in your state of motion. And we call the other the gravitational mass. And we divide the gravitational mass into two types, active gravitational mass and, and, re, and passive gravitational mass. So for example, take the Earth-Moon system, right? Earth is the active mass creating this bigger gravity well, and the moon can be thought of as the passive responder to the gravity well. But anyway, if you take a box that has perfectly mirrored walls and you fill it with light, the pressure on every wall is going to be identical, right? It's going to be bouncing off the wall. It's going to be identical. Now, let's suppose it's moving at constant velocity, or standing still is the exact same thing, right? Mo pressure all equal on all walls. Now, suppose you try to change its state of motion, accelerate it. Then what's going to happen is the wall at the backside that you're pushing forward, you're going to push forward to meet those extra photons. So you're going to get more collisions than you otherwise would. And the opposite wall in the direction you're moving, you're moving it away from the photons. And so it's going to have a less pressure. So you're going to get out an inertial property of, an, of a resistance to its change of motion, even though there is no mass. And the second thing is, E equals mc squared, the energy of that light is going to curve space-time just like a mass of that space-time would. So Albert Einstein is the person who figured this all out. He was like, mass doesn't really exist. The only thing there is is energy. 
And when you can find energy, like in a proton, it appears to be the stuff that we call mass, but it's just energy. And if we can get that energy out, yo, guess what? We can make these giant bombs. <laughs> and that's what they did, right? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's interesting too, because that idea that uh, there is no mass, there's just energy, um, kind of relates uh, to that, uh, this idea with, uh, with Tesla, you know, that basically you can take energy from maybe even the sun, uh, essentially. It, this is an interesting thought because yeah. he created a, it, it's not, is this the photovoltaic effect? Because if you look at Tesla's patent, right, if you just take uh, aluminum foil or any conductive metal and then connect it to the ground, actually, you will create uh, energy. You will essentially create uh, a current create energy. Flows, you know about a current to flow somehow? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Not well, even with another... the not with the photovoltaic. Yeah. Have you heard of the vacuum current. breakdown? Not... No. Yeah. So if you take two plates and put it in a perfect vacuum, all right? Mm -hmm. And you start increasing the voltage between those plates, all right? And you have like an ammeter to measure current. There will be no current, no current, no current. And then at a specific, you know, high enough uh, field strength, suddenly there's a current flowing. And what's happening is, is that virtual particles, right? Are you familiar with virtual particles? Take yes, that energy yeah, I know. Yep. and become real Casimir particles. effect? Is this the Casimir? No, Casimir? no, it's, a, it's oh. another manifestation. Right. Okay. The Casimir effect is a is a geometrical thing that when you bring plates close together, just like I was saying with the guitar string, there are yep. more uh, possible states of these outside virtual particles inside. outside than inside. So it acts like a pressure. In this case, what you're doing is you're creating a strong field. It's kind of like when Hawking explained Hawking radiation, where virtual particles exist on the edge of a black hole. One is sucked in and the other isn't type of thing. But yeah. in this case, you're given so much energy, or even if you have a high energy photon, a gamma ray, in a bubble chamber experiment, passes near a neutron or a proton, and it becomes a matter antimatter particle, right? What it's done is mm -hmm. it's given its energy to these virtual particles, and uh, they become real particles in our universe. In the same way, that strong field gives energy to these virtual particles, and suddenly you get this current of particles, right? Yeah, and, exactly. And the, and the idea yeah. of virtual particles. Well, never mind. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the, the whole idea that you can generate a photon, you can generate electricity or force. Ascent. You're generating a force from light. Yeah. <laughs> you know that that yeah. whole thing. I don't. I yeah. still don't think we understand fully. And and I think once that's nailed down, Man, um, we say all kind of stuff that, that we don't understand. Like we say the word charge all the time, right? Electric charge. What the hell is electric charge? Or even, know. you know, spin, right? These electrons and protons, they have an intrinsic angular momentum, but they're not actually little spheres. They're not actually spinning. Not. Well, how the hell they have angular momentum? We, you know, we don't, we don't know what this yeah. shit is. Space, yeah. time. Are they emergent? Are they fundamental? You know, man, there's so much we say and take for granted that we truly yeah. don't understand fundamentally, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know. That's 100%, man. I'm so happy to, to, to talk with you. Yeah. Dr. O, this is yeah, your that's, that's paper, the article. Right? Yeah, yeah, article. that's the article, man. It tells a, a very, very sad story of, uh, you know, a dude just looking for the truth and then getting freaking, you know, attempted cancellation from it. They didn't realize that I was born canceled. <laughs> so you were born canceled. I was born canceled. If you read my memoir. My unlikely journey through space and time. That's why the journey yes. was so damn unlikely. And you can sorry. see my personality, man. You know, I'm always. Can you hold that buck up? I'm sorry. I want to. Oh, can you hold it back? We couldn't see it yeah. very well. A quantum life. Cool, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, exciting. So for your I, yeah. audience, you know, I'm, I'm from a crime family, like, like literally, like my first cousin. Crime family. Oh yeah, my first cousins were members of the Crips gang. Uh, the the nice. males in the early 70s and That's you know in the 80s really two, you know these dudes started robbing banks and murdering people so in the 80s you know a couple of them went to prison um one is still there and you know after getting released and starting robbing banks again and then my father was a big drug dealer and he incorporated me into the family business by the age of nine so by the time i'm 13 <laughs> you know I'm, i got my own business by the time i'm 16 i'm carrying a gun every day you know it's like wow you know and then ultimately Amazing. found myself drug addicted you know at 21 through 21, 23, and 25. And then, you know, 
realized that, hey, I'm not trying to die here <laughs> and, and uh, you know, came out of it. But that's you so know, cool, it, man. It, yeah. So and you turn it around after that or were you studying college and drug dealing? At the same time, man. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yeah. The, I was the DJ and the drug dealer at Tougaloo College in, in the late 80s. And uh, I go to Stanford for graduate school. And, you know, my first year there, I go back in. Right. So, you know, and I'm the man yeah. and I find myself at gunpoint a number of times. And, you know, it was just a it's a it's a rough story. In fact, it was so rough when I admitted, originally submitted the manuscript at one hundred and fifty thousand words. The editor was like, get rid of fifty thousand. And by the way, you got to get rid of, rid of a lot of these stories, man, because you're just abusing yeah. a reader at this point. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it, it, it's quite the story. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. And then. So now what is your take on the future? You know, do you think we're going to yeah. have this amazing breakthroughs right now with is JWST going to show us that we're surrounded by life forms and there's life inside the sun even? I don't It's it's the one that can possibly, mm -hmm. but there is a problem with JST. And that is is that the mid resolution spectroscopy mode instrument they find that there's extra friction in it that shouldn't be there. Right? Heard about that. It's, yeah, and that's the one that could take spectra of these exoplanet atmospheres and find mm -hmm. evidence of biomarker molecules for life. So I was really excited <laughs> that, you know, like, hey, you know, quickly, we're going to find, look at that planetary atmosphere. It's full of oxygen mm -hmm. and methane and, you know. But, you know, if that instrument does, ends up not working, then then that, that's going to be a big bummer. They'll still have the low resolution spectrograph, but, you, you know, you're not going to be able to do as much of the science. And then I'm really excited about these um, solar system missions like DART, not DART, excuse mm -hmm. me, Dragonfly going mm -hmm. to Titan and, and the moon Titan and flying around, you know, and seeing what's cool. there, like a rover on Mars, but on the moon Titan, which is the other body in the solar system with abundant surface liquids. Uh, and then there's the Enceladus mission, right? The Europa mission, right? Um, and there's a, the so-called Europa lander, which keeps going in and out of the budget. But the idea of landing on Europa and drilling into the ice, mm. sampling, you know, the surface near these cracks, you know, that's really exciting. Mm. And, you know, I, I just felt like, you know, with James Webb and then a test satellite, which is finding planets around the nearby stars, which are the ones that have enough light to allow us to do good spectroscopy. Uh, mm. You know, I felt like we're on the, the, the eve of finding life somewhere else. But, yeah. you know, the James Webb news is, is like, yikes, please be OK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. that is. I heard it was a minor friction issue, but they always say minor, right? Till it turns. Major. Man, if you're having a friction issue in space, minor can be major really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. there's no hope of uh, like you could repair Hubble because it was in low Earth orbit, low Earth orbit. There is no repairing um, Webb. The Webb telescope, if it, if something's too goes far, wrong. yeah, it's way yeah, too, far. too far, yeah, it, or unless we do like one of those. Remember that movie where they, where they went to the asteroid to, to blow it up? Judge, yes, something day was the name Bruce of it, Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis, Armageddon, yeah. I think, yeah, Armageddon, that's right. So, what if yeah. we have a Bruce Willis one way mission? We need you guys to repair, and when I say guys, I mean men and women yeah. and anybody else, but we need you guys to go there on this one way trip to repair. The James Webb Space Telescope. Then after that, we we're sending you to the sun. <laughs> yeah, the sun. I mean, or maybe Venus. if it was somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Venus. Send you yeah. to Venus. Right. You got to go inward. You can't come back out. <laughs> what do you, so? What do you think about life being closer? You know what? A well, first, what do you think about UAPs, uh, and then maybe in our own solar system? Yeah. So in our own solar system, I think the probability is high, right? Because there's fluids. Yeah. Wherever there's fluids, I think yeah. there's a high probability of life. What about the sun? You know, I hear a lot of UAPs yeah. where you actually have plasma. You know, you you, you hear about <laughs> these pretty compelling stories, you know, from credible yeah. people. One was a, he was a sailor, right, on the back yeah. of a ship. And this giant orange orb just warps in, essentially, you yeah. know, just hanging yeah. out there and then just just warps out, you yeah. know, basically light well, speed. And yeah. that's the thing, you know, my, my, my thought on UAPs is the following, right? There are certain physical limits that you have to get across and you you know warp is one of the ways right and there's very few ways that we know about that are consistent with the laws of physics so the first thing is you can't just move through space at any speed you want to right you can move from here to there at the speed of light and faster 
based on warp technology, the, the Alcubierre white drive, right? Mm -hmm. um, you go 10 times the speed of light potentially. But in that case, you're not really moving through space. You're inside of a warp bubble, right? But if you're just moving through space like normal propulsion type thing, the faster you go, the greater the energy of your collisions with the particles in space. So, you know, at a certain speed, you're going to fry yourself, okay? The second thing is, if you get up to a speed that you can go interstellar, not warp, right? How do you get rid of that speed when you get to where you're going? Right? So the way physics works is, like, for example, we just had the Artemis uh, rocket come back to Earth. The very different problem from coming from low Earth orbit. Because the way physics works, the farther away you come from, it's like you fail to that location. So you're going a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So when we had that asteroid, that that object, Oumuamua, Oma Oumuamua, Oumuamua, yeah, Oumuamua. The reason we know it was from outside our solar system was because of its speed, right? You're, you've fallen so from yeah. such a great distance, you're going so fast, right? So mm -hmm. if you're coming from some distant star, it's like you fell to Earth from light years away, <laughs> you know, and so. You're going to go a hell of fast, right? And you have to get rid of that speed somehow. Um, now, if you have warp drive, you can do all this stuff. But normal propulsion has major problems. Yeah, I think, in, and you hear about all the UAPs, you know, there's no sound. Yeah. It seems like, and often they move in kind of quantum movements, you know, very Weird quickly. Weird movements, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but interesting to me, there's no sound. Uh, that. And yeah. no supersonic booms. So like you mentioned, is if you're going to go through space, you're going to run into those little particles. And like, That's right. like you kind of mentioned, is the inertia. So yeah. if, you're, if, you're go if I'm going light speed, actually, uh, I won't know it, <laughs> uh, no. essentially, right? Well, right. Something hit, yeah. But something would hit me, because in my inertial frame, you're this at is rest what always. it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Well, just like yeah. if I'm in a fighter, everybody asks me, what does it feel like to go supersonic? You know yeah. what I'm like? nothing <laughs> you know like it feels like nothing so <laughs> thank you for I'm that going, insight because yeah, that's the kind of yeah. questions i ask <laughs> yeah but let me tell you no, you're not. in trouble i feel bad if, if i'm if it's i'm not on doing it on purpose then it's yeah. i'm immediately in trouble you know and yeah. it's just a little number this it goes from 0. 0.99 to one you know you're like oh crap like because it means you you know sonic boom the whole oh area you know the right. county <laughs> yeah i've seen those like videos where people they sonic boom you boom yeah but man yeah. let me tell you so i asked like you know I, I met a lot of astronauts and i asked them like yeah tell me something about going to space that you wouldn't think of and they're like you know what's crazy man is that your inner ear resets right uh -huh. so when you get back in gravity the slightest movement of your head sends you into a freaking you know like you've just been on one of those carnival rides that <laughs> spins you around yeah. that's interesting yeah because it works by little the otolith organs in your yeah, you know little, little hairs, hairs in your ear yeah but if you're in weightless for so long i wonder like those little hairs like atrophy maybe and they like, get super sensitive is they what never get you super sensitive okay. super sensitive yeah. yeah to the slightest little movement so you're like once you're back in gravity you know that is just like it's way too sensitive now <laughs> you're you know yeah chris sir i love the conversation with you man excellent my time is up, though. I have to go you, fight mate. some aliens. Oops, I didn't say that. I'm going to have to neuralize all your audience. Where's my... Excellent. Dang it, I don't have my my neuralizer. Okay, so... <laughs> well, Dr. O, I mean, it, re it really was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking your time. And yeah. I I'll love that your theory back. aligned. Yeah. Huh? I'd be so happy to have you on again and yeah. uh, talk more about uh, your I love hypothesis it, man. and ours. And sounds you know, great, I can't man. have Thank these conversations so with my colleagues, right? They're like... Oh, yeah. Somebody's gonna find out. We're gonna get blacklisted. Yeah. I'm like, come no, on. Live stream. I want to leave you with this last thing. So I was reading. Um, you know, Albert Einstein wrote books, and he has this book from 1938 about the the evolution of physics. And one thing he pointed out was something that I had missed. And he's like, you know, if you look at like the first modern scientist, like most Westerners don't know of him. It's a guy named Ibn Al Haytham. Uh, he wrote the book of optics around the year. Uh, in fact, I was like, hey, we should have been celebrating a thousand years of the scientific method a couple of years. I think 1021 is when he wrote the book, the book of optics. So when Albert Einstein, not Albert Einstein, thank you, Don, when uh, um, when uh, um, Isaac Newton said, if I've seen farther than others, thank you too, Nufo, that <laughs> it's because John Lee. Oh, dude, it is. Come to my spot. <laughs> Come. 
I got you. Hey, so uh, when um, when Newton said, if I've seen farther than others, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants. One of the people he was talking about was mm -hmm. Ibn al-Haytham. But here's the thing. What Einstein says is, is the reason why Aristotle's physics lasted for so many centuries, right? Mm -hmm. You know, more than a millennium is because it was consistent with all observations. Mm -hmm. And even though observation is the final uh, thank you, Llewellyn, is the final, you know, arbiter of what is true and what is false. It is not what gets us to the deeper truths. It is imagination. So Galileo, mm -hmm. when he imagined an experiment that you could never do, that's what allowed him to figure out inertia, mm -hmm. which we now call Newton's first law of motion. And what was that experiment? Imagine there's no friction. You can't do that experiment ever, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, Doing this sort of exercise of imagination is as important as any calculation, as any sort of rigorous process. And I think that we've kind of gotten away from that because we're afraid of what our colleagues may think, right? If we yeah. think these crazy thoughts. So that's what my next book is going to be about, these crazy thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, it hurts to fail. It hurts. It and does. You don't like being told you're wrong. You know, but, when you're wrong, but success hurts. hurts too, man. Like every time I make a discovery, yeah. I'm happy for like a few yeah. hours and then I get scared because now it means I got to do more tomorrow. Right. That's so, yeah, that's such an interest. Yeah. That's such a true point, man. I feel the yeah. same. Um, but I, yeah. yeah, I love, we're on the right path. I love that there's people like you out there, same. you know, yeah. changing, changing around for one thing, just showing people that. Uh, knowledge is information is free now and you can get it and you can build the person you want to be, I yeah. think. And that's just yeah. such an amazing example. Exactly. Man. Thanks so and much. The other and thing, I, the other yeah. thing too, dude, you'll notice is that I don't speak in uh, academic talk. I speak pretty much like the dude growing up in Mississippi without, yeah. you know, most of the curse words and just to show people too, man, you know, you don't have to be some prototype of uh, what's that dude name? Sheldon. What's his last name? Sheldon on the big bang theory. Sheldon, oh, right? Sheldon. We don't, yeah. You don't have to be that. this proto, yeah. you know, this stereotype of a scientist yeah. to do this. You know, you could be a weed yeah. smoking, shit talking, uh, you know, That's you could be I whatever am, yeah. the hell you are. <laughs> you have a brain yeah. and you're, you know, you're valuable. Your contribution is valuable. All right. And respect your yeah. mother. Peace. Thank you so much, man. See you, Dr. O. Thanks everybody for being here. It's a great show. I learned a ton. Peace.